Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Naomi Hausman. I'm the Director of Institutional Advancement here at Gratz College. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to the second presentation of uh, Gratz at Home webinar series. Thank you for joining us. We're thrilled that you're here tonight. Um, I, be, I will be filling in tonight for Lori Cohen. Uh, during this presentation, just a few notes to about the technology. Uh, make sure that your vol volume is turned up. Uh, and uh, if you are interested in participating in the chat, you're welcome to. Uh, the way to access the chat function is just to sort of wave your cursor over the bottom black bar of your screen, and you'll see the little chat button there. Um, it has little three little dots and a little cartoon bubble. Um, so when you uh, put uh, when you uh, participate in chat, just know that uh, we will see your questions or comments. And so will everybody else who's participating in the uh, conversation tonight. So we encourage you to jump in and um, uh, share any thoughts or questions. When uh, our presenter is finished with his talk at about 8.45 or so, um, I will pose your questions um, to Dave and uh, we'll, we'll see if he can answer as many as possible before we end at nine o'clock. Um, so now it is my pleasure to introduce our presenter, Dave Malter. Uh, Dave is relatively new to Gratz College. We're thrilled that he's here. Um, he is serving as the director of our Master's of Arts in Education and our Master of Science in Camp Administration and Leadership, the newest program here at Gratz College. Uh, and he'll tell you more about that when he uh, introduces himself. Uh, so as you know, tonight he's going to be discussing the topic, reigniting the spark of conversation. Uh, we're thrilled to have him and come on, Dave. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, Naomi. Thanks to everybody for tuning in. If you're out there live, it's good to see you. Uh, just want to introduce myself a little bit as we get started. Uh, so as Naomi mentioned, I'm the director of two programs here at Gratz. One is the Master of Arts in Education. I've been an educator for a long time. I teach uh, at Temple University, and before that, I taught at Montclair State University. And in addition, I, uh, this is going to be my 33rd summer at summer camp. Uh, so I work with camps across the country on staff training, leadership, culture, uh, employee engagement, topics along those lines. Uh, my wife, Pam, is a camp director in the Poconos where I spend my summers. So uh, a lot of what we're talking about tonight is coming from uh, a camp perspective, me working with uh, young people ages of 17 to really 25 and how they work. Uh, so that's really what, what we're starting with and kind of where the messaging comes from. So. Uh, we'll get started now. Okay, so as Naomi said, the, the topic of the conversation is really reigniting the spark of conversation. And this stems from what I think all of us have heard and talked about in terms of social media, technology, uh, really taking over our world and how that's affecting our real lives and affecting how we, uh, how we deal with ourselves at work, at home, uh, in our relationships. And I think that what I'd like to talk about is really what's happening uh, to our young people uh, as social media has, has gotten to be a bigger part of our lives. And when they come to work, when they have their first jobs, you know, many 17-year-olds are, are coming to the workforce for the first time, uh, and even some 21-year-olds, some 22-year-olds. What I've seen is that, you know, all of those words that are up on the screen right now are really true. Uh, they're a little bit lost. They're unsure as to how work works. They don't know how to communicate with their bosses or their peers because much of our communication now is done in a very different way than it was generations past. So that's really kind of the starting point of some of these trends that we're seeing in, in our society. So there's kind of a big picture that I, I wanna paint for everybody um, and it comes from two different areas. One is this immense amount of pressure that people are under today. Uh, so young people today are starting to build resumes when they're in seventh or eighth grade. And they're starting to feel the pressure of what school are you going to go to? What college are you going to go to? Uh, what do you want to do with your life? What do you want to do uh, down the road? And kind of some of our youth is, is a little bit taken away. And they're really finding that school is a highly pressurized situation where they're not allowed to really do the things that they love and enjoy. Instead, they're being pressured to perform well on tests, to get specific grades, to participate in activities in a way that makes them maybe not understand what their values are and not really interact in a genuine way. They're also incredibly overscheduled. If you were to ask any 16 to 25 year old what their schedule looks like, you wouldn't be able to follow it. 
Uh, it's absolutely incredible what they're expected to do, their demands on their time, uh, the amount of sleep that they're getting or not getting is pretty remarkable. So there's this real overscheduling. There's actually a couple places I like to point people to. One is if you're on Facebook, you can look up the group Mamas, which is Moms Against More Activities, which I thought was pretty ironic. And what they do is they advocate for taking away some activities from their kids. Uh, there's also, I sometimes uh, bring out a book called Overscheduled Andrew. So you know that it's a problem in society when they start making a children's book about an overscheduled child. Uh, in this case, it's a little owl child, but we get the point. And Andrew's okay at the end. He figures it out and he makes his friends and he takes away some activities. But that's a good indication that there's a real problem going on in society when you're actually writing books about children being overscheduled. So that's kind of the first part of this picture that I want everybody to kind of think about. Uh, and then the next piece is really the social media and kind of the lost connections that are happening out there. Some pretty dire statistics out there uh, that these are actually a couple years old, so they actually might be a little bit worse now than they were. But 81% uh, of people admit that they will interrupt a conversation, a meal, time with friends to check their social media, their text messages, their emails, whatever it might be. Uh, three out of five people spend more free time on their computer than they do with their significant others. I mean, this is really startling, uh, and it's also causing this incredible amount of stress, right? So, but even though it's causing this stress, we still spend so much time using it. So while we're aware that it's causing stress in our lives, we're almost unable to put it down. And it's become pretty much a, a, the issue that's going on with young people today. So I typically don't like to categorize people, but I thought this was a pretty telling statistic. Uh, and actually, yeah, I was born in 1978, so I don't fit in any of those categories, so I'm not to blame, uh, so it's not my fault. But millennials and Gen Xers are really what we're looking at, because those are the people that are working in your, in your workplaces. They're the people that we're depending on for our futures. Uh, they're saying they feel themselves that they're worried about the negative effects of social media. So they, again, they feel it, they know that it's affecting their physical and mental health, but they're still spending time, a lot of time using it. So there's something going on there that we can talk about a little bit more later that's causing people to really be dependent on this social media and technology, even though it's causing bad effects. It's kind of like people who keep eating fast food, even though they know that it's unhealthy and it's gonna make them die earlier. Uh, it's kind of a, a similar situation. Um, Something else that's really concerning is parents. Parents are very concerned about their children. 81% uh, of parents feel that their child's exposure, they're worried about their child's exposure to inappropriate content. Uh, and they're also, 63% are worried about face-to-face -face interactions with friends or family. So there's some real parental concern, although we're not seeing a shift right now of parents taking it away, although I was speaking to a colleague earlier, and there does seem to be some movement towards that, I'm just not convinced that it's actually going to happen, which we can talk about in the chat later on. So what that's causing is kind of like we have these two issues and there's one path. So what's happening is that these two issues are really causing people to feel an incredible amount of stress and it's causing them to feel some sort of mental health issue. Uh, if you go to any college campus right now, the mental health counseling facilities are completely overrun. Uh, they can't keep up with the amount of students who they're away from home for the first time. It's the first time they're truly accountable for their own grades and their own lives, and they don't know how to handle it. They haven't gone through any failure. They're used to this online kind of interaction. They're having a hard time really dealing with real everyday life. They're not prepared for it. So you're seeing this pathway to these two major issues. And really, it becomes kind of a sad statistic where what we're seeing is that people are really having mental health issues and really leading to increased suicide. Uh, there was just a study that came out that between 2007, I believe, and 2015, the amount of ER visits of children between the ages of 5 to 11 for suicide attempts doubled, which is tremendously horrible uh, and it's only going to get worse on top of that their caregivers are having the same kind of increase in suicide attempts so people are feeling stress and it most of the studies that we see are attributing that to some sort of 
correlation with social media and how much time people are spending online uh, that's causing them to be unhappy. And my goal for tonight is not to scare you and not to make this sound horrible, but really I want you to have a background of, of what's going on and then to talk about some ways that we can maybe overcome that in our own environments and communities. So I really feel that schools, colleges, employers, and camps, because that's where I, I spend a lot of my time, we need to respond. Uh, and I always tell people we can't change the world, right? We, we are, we're in small environments right here at Gratz College or wherever you might work or the communities that you're in. But if we can make enough of a difference in our own small worlds, there's that opportunity that those people are going to go out to their greater worlds and kind of spread it around and pass it forward. So that's really my hope is that we can make a small difference and then people will continue on that path. A lot of what I found and the reason why I got interested in this is I, I listened to a lot of NPR, WHYY, our local Philadelphia NPR, in the car, spent a lot of time in the car. Uh, it's kind of my go-to. And there was an interview with this author, Johan Hari. Uh, and the book was called Lost Connections that the author wrote. And I will just preface this with the book was a little bit controversial because he takes an interesting stance about mental health and, and doctors and um, medicine. And now I'm a son of a psychiatrist, so I have a lot of respect for the medical field. I am not a doctor, uh, although I am pursuing a doctorate at the moment. But there was some real value, I think, to his message. We don't have to agree with necessarily his methodology. Basically, what happened was he had been on antidepressants for almost his entire life since he was, he was a young child, and it wasn't working. And they kept giving him more and more and more, and he kept feeling worse and worse and worse, and eventually decided, I'm not going to take this medicine anymore, and I'm going to find something else that can replace that will, that will make me feel better. And what he found was human connection is what did it. Uh, so while we don't all have to agree on his method, and I'm not encouraging anybody to stop going to their physician, uh, to stop their medication, that is not what I'm prescribing, I'm not a doctor, don't do that. Uh, I am saying that the messages here were really interesting, and there's three key messages that really inform what the work that I'm doing and, and what we're talking about. One is the increase in medication. So while the population has only gone up 21%, in 20 or so years, the amount of prescriptions have, it has increased by 85%. Okay? And a lot of that is the advent of ADD and ADHD as diagnoses. Right? As I said, my father was a psychiatrist and I grew up in middle school and high school when ADD and ADHD first started becoming these kind of well-known and possibly overdiagnosed uh, diseases. Uh, and he was actually somebody who didn't believe that every child in our school had this and should be medicated. So he saw this increase in prescriptions and, and you've seen it kind of continue. Uh, you know, we have this opioid crisis in our country right now, uh, which is another indication that people are being over medicated. Instead of treating the symptom, we're kind of treating, you know, the overall picture. Uh, and just it's very easy and it's also much cheaper to treat somebody by giving them a pill than by actually spending the time to get them through their issues. Uh, so that's a major issue that we're looking at. His second was that there is real magic to human connection. I was actually talking to Naomi earlier. We were talking about this a little bit. And something that I always like to tell people is that no matter what you believe in, whether it's Adam and Eve or evolution or a little bit of both, it doesn't matter, right? Adam needed Eve for lots of reasons. And as I said, we still need Eve, right, for many reasons, for all the reasons. And then you look at evolution, you look at cavemen and women, right, nomadic tribes. They didn't travel independently. They traveled in groups. And once in a while, there was somebody who went off for some sort of enlightenment on their own. They almost never came back. They were either eaten by something or got lost, right? We need connection. We're pre-wired that way, right? That's how our brains function. Uh, so there's real magic to the idea that connecting with other human beings in a real face-to-face, -face, not online way is super important. And it's something that we need to encourage and incorporate more into our everyday lives. And that if you feel good, you do good, right? So we want people to feel good in our businesses, in our schools, in our lives, in our homes, because if they feel good, they're gonna do good for other people. They're gonna feel better about life. They're gonna be more productive. It's an ultimate goal that we should all have. So those are kind of the three messages from that book that informed this kind of research that I've been doing. So I want to show you this quick video. Um, it's only a couple minutes. I'm good, Bashir. Hello. <laughs> 
Hello. Hello. My name is Leila. Yeah. Are you here with your parents or? Yeah, with my mom. Are you sure you're something? <laughs> no. It's kind of boring having a tea or coffee by yourself. You need somebody to talk to. Why are you wearing a hat? How much money do you have? Why is your hair white? It's a bit like the trees in autumn, you know, you could ask the tree, why are your leaves brown? <laughs> do you mean in the bank or...? Like your pocket money and stuff like that. £560 a month for pension. Wow. If you had that, what would you do? I you... would get a dog and get a house and a swimming pool and go next back to... Do you have Netflix? Nothing like that. I've just got a radio. We normally play ball dog. You people. still play? Yeah. I remember playing that. Peter Piper picked the pack of pickled peppers. Peter Piper picked a... <laughs> okay. Where are your friends and where they are? Mm. Right now. Some of my friends are abroad. I was born in Jamaica. So a lot of my friends are there. You know. I mean, I'm new in London. Well, I've had hundreds and thousands of friends. At the moment, I've got, got a lot of Facebook friends. Well, maybe I can sit with you and have some coffee. Yeah. You like coffee? Yeah. Do you? Do you? What's your favourite? Hot chocolate. Hot chocolate. Why can't everybody be friends? <laughs> That's a good question. It's not as easy as that, really. I couldn't walk up to somebody in here and say, would you like to play with me? I'd be a bit strange. I think everyone should talk to everybody. That's the nicest thing I've heard all day. You've really made my day. Making friends is easier than eating chocolate. I think everyone in the world should have one big party and become friends. Sorry, buddy. So I show you this video, not just because it's super cute and it's really nice to see these kids, but really there's something to be said about how we make friends and what communication looks like and how easy it is and how innate it is in our, in our lives. So again, it's all about this human connection and that it's just something that comes naturally. And I think we forget as adults or as, as teenagers, as, as young adults, what that all really means and what it looks like and what it feels like. And this is a great indication that it takes very little for people to really connect. It takes such a small, it takes a question. It takes just putting yourself out there. But those skills have really been lost to a certain extent. That there's really something to be said for what we're doing online uh, and what we're doing on our phones and on our computers have really kind of diluted some of these skills that are really innate and really easy to bring back out if we just take the time to do it. Um, so what does human connection do? And why is it so important? So if you look at connection, right? First of all, like I said earlier, we're built that way. It's how we're built. It's, it's what we're meant to be. And we're kind of hurting ourselves when we're not taking advantage of that. Uh, it's, it's making a lot of things more difficult than they need to be. Uh, we are always longing as human beings for closeness and connection, and everybody feels that way, right? Everybody feels that they need some closeness and some connection with somebody else. Whether it's one person or, or more than one person, it doesn't matter. It makes you feel better. Uh, it's why as people age, it's important to keep them active and with other people. Uh, we look at what the average American looks at. We only trust 10 to 20 people, but I think the average number of Facebook friends is a lot higher than that. Right? Most people I know have a thousand or more Facebook friends. Right? So are those real friends? Are those people that we can really depend on? So again, looking at those people that we really trust and making sure that we're valuing those relationships. Um, this is an interesting t statistic because in 2005 is actually when Facebook first started. Uh, so if you look at from 1985 to 2004, before really the advent of technology, because I didn't get my first email address till 1998, was my first email address. I didn't have an internet connection where I lived until 1999. So it was real, really early and really soon in 2004, right? But the number of confidence just in that span went from three to two. So think about what's happened from 2004 to 2019 with all this different technology. How many confidence do people have now, do you think? It's probably gone down, is my guess. 
And people who have strong social relationships definitely tend to live longer, right? If you look at somebody who's aging and their friends around them start to, to unfortunately pass away and their social lives get smaller and their circles get smaller and smaller, that person tends to get sicker faster. Uh, and because those social relationships and that connection is really, really important to keep us going. Uh, so what does it take to be connected and to have friendships? Well, you need 200 hours is kind of the benchmark for when you become connected to somebody. So think about how much time that is spent with somebody not behind a desk, right? Actually interacting and actually spending time with people. Living together is a huge part of it, right? That's why a lot of people choose to live together before they get married, to see if they really do connect and really can get along. There has to be some sort of social interaction component of it. So working in an office where you're in your own cubicles or your own desk with your headphones on and not interacting with other people is not true connection. And it's not developing those skills and those parts of the brain that we need to, to really exercise. Typically, a friendship evolves in three to nine weeks. So that's when you really, when you're spending that much time together when you're interacting socially that's how much time it takes to really start developing a friendship and the most common way to build a friendship is to participate in a joint activity which is not work right so work does not count as a joint activity it's something social it's something a little bit more interesting it's got to be by choice so if you look at students if you look at young people who are in school they're not building true friendships while they're sitting in a classroom because they have to go to school they don't have a choice Right? And for many of them, they have to go to music lessons or math lessons or whatever it is, because that's the pressure that they're feeling that I talked about earlier. So even that's not by choice, and it's not truly social. So finding opportunities to create those moments for people is really, really important. I like to think of connection in three different types as we think about how we can restart these conversations and, and get people to start really interacting with each other again. So there's active connection. There's dormant and there's commemorative. Active is when you go to lunch with somebody or like that video that we saw, where you're really connecting with people, you're making coffee dates, you're going to see people on a regular basis. Dormant is kind of what Facebook is, right? When you have 2,000 friends on Facebook and you only have 10 to 20 true friends, most of those relationships are dormant, right? Which means that you're just waiting for them to post something. You're waiting for something to happen. And it could not happen for a really long time. Or most people only interact when it's somebody's birthday. And Facebook tells you, oh, it's so-and-so's birthday. And then you say, okay, great, happy birthday. And then another year goes by and you do it again. Commemorative is like going to your high school reunion. Remember when? Right? Remember when we were so young and we used to do these crazy things? That's a commemorative connection that you only do once every 10 years, 20 years, whatever it might be. And it's really stuck in the past rehashing those old memories. So we really don't want those things. What we're striving for are really active connections, where we're really finding opportunities, again, to see each other face-to-face, -to, -face, to have some one-on-one -on -one time or group social time, where you are shutting everything else down and you're spending time with one another, relearning how to communicate. So when we look at it, we have to look to ourselves, like what opportunities exist, right? What opportunities are out there that exist? So I think a huge one is unplugging to connect. So if you work someplace or if you're in a community and you have some sort of leadership ability, encouraging people to just turn it off, right? Put your phones away, put your computers away, just spend some time with each other. And really making it a point to find opportunities to turn it all off and to spend time with each other. I know this sounds really simple, but it's really important. Kind of like we saw in that video, talking to people, asking them questions, getting to know them, spending time together that's unfiltered and without a screen in between you, right? Really finding opportunities to talk to each other, to find out what your goals are, to find out what your dreams are, to ask really important, interesting questions. And then building community. And I think it's something that, you know, here at Graz, it's something that we do really well, which is evidenced by what we're doing tonight or when we have lunch and learns here on campus or when we all get together as a group to even watch like world events as they happen live here on campus, which we do pretty often, important events. Finding opportunities to really build community is super important. And we want to encourage people to really do that. And again, turn things off, right? And find moments where we can really find commonality and restart the conversations. 
the other thing, you know, I mentioned earlier that I really like NPR. And so a little while ago, I'll tell you a funny story. I re-upped my sustaining membership for whatever number it is per month. And one of the choices was a Mr. Rogers mug. Okay. That, I mean, Mr. Rogers, I mean, he's having kind of a renaissance right now. Um, he's having a you know, resurgence in, in our pop culture. And he's such a great kind of icon. And, and I'm a big coffee mug guy. I'm actually, if I bring one home, I actually have to get rid of one now. So Mr. Rogers now, right, that was the gift. But not only is it a Mr. Rogers mug, but when you put hot liquid into it, did you see what happened? It went from his blazer to his cardigan. I mean, it was kind of a no-brainer. What happened was is that somebody was at our house and put the Mr. Rogers mug in the dishwasher without me knowing, and it ruined the mug. But I had it long enough to take a picture to share with you. And I don't show it to you just because I think it's fun and I wanted you to know a little bit more about me, but because it's all about this power of language. I think something that we've lost sight of is how important language is. And if Mr. Rogers is somebody that we could all really learn from. So when I work with camps, I talk to them a lot about putting language up on the walls. Or if I talk to a private school that I work with a lot, I talk to them about looking at the walls and putting up the language that they want their students and their staff to use with each other. I think it's really, really important to let people know that you care. You know, like Mr. Rogers says, I like you the way you are, right? You're special because he talks about failure. Right? The failure is okay. It's about lifting each other up. It's all this positive language that I think is really important, and we need to start incorporating back into our everyday lives. So if you work someplace, or if you're part of a community, or part of a school, how do you do that? Right? I think it's going to be a, make a huge difference in the way people interact with each other and connect with each other and really are able to change the dynamic and how people connect. And it helps with conversations. If you feel trusted and you feel loved, and you feel empowered and supported because people are using positive language around you, you're going to be more likely to share what's going on. You're going to feel more likely to connect with that other person. So I think the power of language is super important. Any change that you do has to be intentional. And it can't just happen by circumstance or because you will it that way. You have to really think about how are you going to make this change for yourself, and then how are you going to help others make this change. And there's lots of different ways of doing it. Some of them I highlighted today, tonight. And I really want you to think as you go back into whatever world that is important to you, how can you make a change to get people to connect with each other once again, knowing what you know about technology and social media and what's happening in the past, I want you to really think about how that's going to affect you and how you can affect other people and make their lives a little bit brighter. So I know it's only 8.30, but now we get to go home early because that's all I have. Um, so if anybody has any questions, I would love to take questions. Um, I'm always happy to do that. All right. So one of the questions I'd like to ask Dave um, is how do you see the use of social media slowing down or will it slow down? Do you think it will slow down at some point? I don't think it's going to slow down. I do think that there's probably a point where it's not going to grow much anymore. Uh, I think there's only like a, a limit of, of how much it can grow. Um, I think so many people have access already that there's not much more to go. I do think that there are some like slight signs of people recognizing the dangers and the issues, uh, but I don't think it's going to stop it. I think we're past a point where we can stop it from happening and we can go backwards. I think we have to really think about uh, how, we can, um, how we can manage it and do a lot of the things that I'm doing today, change it to a positive, encourage people to use it in a responsible way, and then try and get some of these conversations back into the world, get some connection back and do it that way. Okay, another question, Dave, is about the role of educators um, who work in a classroom, either formal or, in, I guess I in the say in the formal learning environment in classrooms, and what, um, what can they do to help accomplish some of these um, ideas that you've put forth? I, really, I love the teachers when I see, um, when, they, when I see teachers who have like those shoe holders on their door where every kid has to put their phone in on their way inside. I love that. I think it's a great idea. But I think it's doing a lot of what I said. I think it's how do we start conversations? How do we get kids talking to each other again, right? Putting them in circles and saying, okay, here's how you have a conversation. Here's how you... Here's how you talk to each other. Here are questions you can ask. Here's, here's a way you can communicate with each other that goes beyond that. Like put the phones away, put the technology away. Here's how we do it. 
right? And really giving them a step-by-step. -step. I think educators can play a huge role in that. And I can be really positive if they just took some time to say, this is how we're going to talk to each other. And again, like I said earlier, using the right language and making that language public as to what people want to do. Okay, Dave, we have a, a great question here. Um, and the question is, I'll just read it. Um, it says, uh, kids just want to talk to adults. Mm -hmm. One adult in the coffee shop said it would be kind of strange for him to just walk up to someone. So it seems the way to have connectivity is natural in is natural settings such as a kiddish lunch, coffee rooms at work. Um, what do you suggest? And is your answer different for adults versus teenagers versus college students to create those natural settings? So I think what the, the question is, is it seems so easy for kids, right? And adults, might, it might seem a little bit stranger. And I actually don't think it is that way. Like I work with young adults all year long. And what I found is they do want to talk to each other. And they want to talk to adults. They want to talk to kids. I right? work in a camp setting where that's all it's about. It's about talking to each other and connecting. And they really want to do it. They just don't know how to. So I think this kind of intentional, where do you do it? So kiddish lunch, coffee rooms at work, right? But, but giving them the opportunity, right? And giving some instruction. I don't think you just put people, like I'm assuming that those kids were with their parents in the video and some producer said, okay, go talk to that guy and ask him, you know, does he like coffee? Right, or something along those lines. They were in a coffee shop. So it wasn't completely natural, but I think that if we put people in the right situations and we give them some direction and it becomes natural, I think it's a matter of exercising kind of that muscle that's already there that we're just not using. But I do think that adults, teenagers, college students, they all do want to have these connections. Uh, and it's just a matter of bringing it out in them and allowing them the space to do it. So hopefully that answers your question. Okay, I do have another question. Oops. I do have another question here. Um, I've met, it's from the same uh, participant. He says, I've met many more neighbors walking my dog than I ever did before I had a dog. The dog, just like kids' activities, are natural, are a natural icebreaker. It's much harder when moving to a new location when kids are older, as the parents do not have as much natural connectivity. How does that fit into your paradigm? So first of all, I just adopted a second dog and everybody should have a dog. That's answer number one. Just everybody get a dog, the world is gonna be a better place because we'll all walk our dogs and all be friends. It's a great question though. And it's true, as we get older, uh, we might have less in common or we have less natural openers to start with. But I'm somebody who everywhere I go, and it might annoy some of those people in my life, but I talk to anybody, right? And I really, whether it's somebody at the cashier, it's somebody in the airport, Whatever it is, I'm constantly talking to people and asking them questions and how are you? And are you from here? What are you, are you in school? What do you do? It's just who I am. And, and I think that just comes from a natural, like kind of inquisitiveness that I, that I have, that I think everybody should do, right? Just engage with people that you see every day. And if it's parents who have older children, there's still ways to connect. You, you know, I, I think we've lost some of this kind of neighborhood community feel where it was okay to like, knock on somebody's door and say, hi, I'm the neighbor, my name's Dave, I'd like to meet you, right? Because we live next door to each other and we can have mutual benefit for each other. Now everybody has a video doorbell on their door, that's protecting them instead of their neighbor looking out for them. Right? Right. So we've lost some of that. So I think we should go to our neighbors and introduce ourselves and say, hey, why don't you come over for a cup of coffee? Because you have no idea what you have in common. I go to a lot of conferences, I do a lot of networking events, and I've built terrific relationships with people that I never would have met otherwise, uh, just by opening yourself up and just asking them who they are and what they like and what they're into and, and inviting yourself into their homes, inviting them into your homes. I think it's really important, especially as we get older, because like I said earlier, having kind of a robust social life as you get older is really important to you living longer, which is something I think we all would agree is a good thing. Okay, I have another question for you, Dave, um, about, so you've talked a lot about how technology has created some difficulty in human connection. Right. How then does um, politics play into that? So we have such uh, sometimes a uh, great deal of frustration. How do we overcome some of those, those um, divisions and perspectives um, in, in this world that we're living in? Uh, turn it off would be number one, right? Like just know that it's not, a lot of what's happening that we're seeing online is artificial. So if you look at Instagram or Facebook or, or even LinkedIn, a lot of it's artificial. It's not real, 
And people have to identify that and realize for themselves that, okay, this is not real life. Not everybody is on a beach in Aruba all the time, right? It's just not reality. Um, and a lot of what we hear on, you know, with politics is really, you know, it's become this, this side versus this side. And I think it is really divisive. I think if we pay too much attention to it, it really does a lot of damage instead of listening to each other's opinions. So I think you, you have to shut some of that down. And, you know, there's all these apps now where you can actually turn, you know, you can set it to turn off at a certain time or block certain apps or, or things like that. And give, give yourself the opportunity, right? right? You know, if you don't, you know, when it was just newspapers, you could choose not to buy the newspaper, right? Before CNN and the 24-hour news cycle, you watch which news channel you like. You didn't have to be exposed to everything. So you can still do that. You, you can still be informed by finding the sources that work well for you that are showing a balance view of both sides, kind of shutting out the rest of the noise. That really is just noise. And recognizing that a lot of the social media and the technology that we're being exposed to are really just there for other people to make lots and lots of money, right? The more you look at it, the more money somebody else is making and the content doesn't really matter to them. Um, it's really about sensationalizing things and making things divisive and working. And I think if more of us turned it off and just realized that we're going to go to the trusted sources that we've always trusted or we find that can be balanced, that we'd be a lot better off. Okay, last question about camp. Yeah. Um, unless any others come through, I'm happy to ask questions. But I do have a question specifically about your experience in camp. So since you've been working in camps over the many years, I'm sure you've seen, as you talked about, uh, the different the, the changes. You've seen mm -hmm. the changes in the kids. Um, if they are, I'm assuming at the camp where you spend a lot of your time in the summers, kids cannot be on their phones all day. Right. Like what is it like that first week of camp? It's it's, tough. it's really tough. Uh, it's a great question. It's not just for the kids either, it's for the staff. So the way I talk I about, right. So, you know, really we talk about in terms of like, let's assume that instead of phones, it's water. And for 10 months, they can drink all the water that they want. And then for two months, there's no water. They would literally die. And that's how people feel when they come to camp and they have to put their phones away. And the way we do it is we provide them opportunities to talk to each other and to recognize that what they're doing at camp, whether they're a staff member or a camper, is much more important than anything else that's going online. Whatever's going on online will be there when you get back. Nobody, you know, if there's an emergency, your parents will get in touch with us, your family will get in touch with you, your friends will. It doesn't matter. We'll figure it out. What's important are the people that are around you and that are with you at that moment that are going to be your friends for life, no matter what you do online. So it's really about encouraging them to have these face-to-face -face conversations. And we do a lot of time together where we give them guided questions. We give them opportunities, kind of what uh, Jeff was asking about earlier, we kind of, we're not kiddish lunches, but they're, you know, they're different opportunities either during the day or during at night but it's just this group of 12 or 15 kids and staff members who are given really structured questions that are getting them to open up and to connect with each other and to learn more about each other. And we really encourage the staff to ask a lot of questions, really getting to know those kids. Because those kids really aren't, nobody's really asking them a lot of questions during the year. They're getting a lot of instruction and they're doing a lot. A lot of people are talking to them, but nobody's asking them a lot. So just the, the pure action of saying, what do you like, right? What do you miss about home, right? Which is an okay question to ask, because that's okay. You want to know about their dog and their trips and their parents and their uncles and their nephews and whoever it might be. You want to know all those things. And they want to share that. And nobody's asking them, you know, what do you love to do? Well, I play the piano. What do you love the piano? And usually the answer is no, but it has, I have to do it because I'm trying to go to college. Well, what do you love? Well, I really love to play the guitar. And that leads to a whole other avenue of, all right, let's go learn how to play the guitar. So it's really, um, it's really interesting to, to see them open up and blossom. Yeah. Okay, we have another question. Um, uh, many kids and young adults I know have no idea how to hold a conversation. Will they be able to hold <laughs> down a job in the future? So if we send them all to camp, yes. Uh, I truly believe that. Uh, it's a great question, and it's one that I don't know if anybody has the answer to. Uh, and yes, the world will go on. People will have jobs, and you know, I was talking to a librarian earlier, uh, Donna, and what we were talking about was, you know, there's spectrums, right? What I'm talking about are really generalities, right? And there's always people on, on one side or the other side of the spectrum. It doesn't have to be just this one thing. And 
I do think there's a lot of really talented, the majority of young people are super talented, have a lot to offer us, and that's really great. Uh, I think we just need to help them reconnect with some skills that are definitely lacking, and there's movement towards that in lots of different places. Okay, the questions are just rolling in, Dave. Look at that. Uh, to keep camp friendships going during the year for long distance campers, Snapchat, Instagram, et cetera, has been, a real, has been very helpful to my kids. That is not needed or should not be needed for kids that go to camp from the same area. So how do you teach kids to use the social media productively? So that, that's a great question. And that's, I don't teach the kids, I teach the parents. So the parents need to learn how to do that. You know, and, and not specifically talking to you, Jeff, but to, to any parent out there, it's really about, are you paying attention, right? I have friends who have five or six-year-olds who are watching screen at dinner, right, when we're out of dinner, to, to behave. And I'll share a story from my youth. It happened a long time ago. My parents are retired. They can't get in trouble anymore. If we, we went out Sunday nights with my grandmother to dinner, and that was the only night we ever went out to dinner, and if we didn't behave... Now, this was in like the early 80s, so it's okay. Uh, we sat in the car. My brother and I, were, we would sit in the car. They would crack the window. We wouldn't eat, and that we knew not to misbehave, right? So I think we need to talk to parents about how can they make sure that what's going on in social media is appropriate. When is the appropriate time to give technology out? What should we be blocking? What should we be allowing? And it's different for every family different depending on how, how many hours we're working, what the pressures are like, but I think parents really have to make these decisions and really understand the impact of what the social media is, is doing to their children and their relationships. And I, you know, we encourage campers to get together and we encourage campers to, yes, interact online. And almost every camp that I know uses social media as a way to keep the community together but it's done in a responsible way. And when we do hear of things that are done that are not correct, then we do address it so it doesn't carry over. Uh, so I think it's, it's kind of this balance, and, and we really have to have great relations between our parents and our educators and our camp professionals. Everybody's got to really communicate well and talk about what we want to see for our children. So thank you, everybody. Okay, Dave, thank you so much. Let me shake your hand. Oh, thank you. Oh. <laughs> um, so uh, I would like to thank again Dave Malter for his very thought-provoking and uh, substantive talk. Uh, thank you, Dave, so much. And thank you all for joining us. Um, thank you for your questions and for pushing us to think a little more deeply about this uh, really interesting topic that affects all of us. Um, so just a few notes. Uh, by the end of the week, you will receive a link to this webinar as a recorded session. Uh, and if you did not join us tonight, you're not hearing my voice, but you will also receive a link. Um, I also want to remind you that our next uh, webinar uh, lecture is scheduled for Wednesday, May 22nd. Uh, at that time, Dr. Ruth Sandberg, who is the director of the Jewish Christian Studies Program at Gratz College, will discuss the Sistine Chapel. Um, so thank you again for tuning in to this presentation at Gratz, of Gratz at Home, and have a great evening.